Uh, I'm Gary Robson, and I'm here to take you behind the scenes at the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary. <laughs> Those are some of the sounds of the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary in Red Lodge, Montana. We're not actually in Yellowstone National Park. The Yellowstone ecosystem is millions of acres, a much larger area than the park itself. Let me introduce you to some of these animals and show you why the animals living at the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary can't live outside on their own. Sometimes it's more obvious why an animal comes to live at a wildlife sanctuary as opposed to living in the wild. This raccoon right here is Mika, and if you look closely you can see that Mika only has three legs. She was hit by a car and ended up coming here because a three-legged raccoon can't make it in the wild. She is still a wild animal, and we still need to keep our fingers well back. Look at her paws. Those paws are like hands with those five fingers that spread way out. Raccoons are capable of opening all kinds of different latches, getting into garbage cans. They can open things that we'd never think an animal could open. They're so clever, they're so good at it, that we'll often feed them with puzzle feeders. So they have to figure out the puzzle to get the box open to get to their food. This keeps them interested. This is something we call enrichment. It keeps them interested and exciting and gives them something to keep not just their body, but their mind active. You can see we've given her lots of places to climb and she climbs around amazingly well for an animal with only three legs. In the wild, you don't see raccoons a lot during the day. They are what we call nocturnal, so they're out and about at night. Their eyes glow. You'll see them when you drive down the road and your headlights will catch one off to the side of the road. And you'll see them often raiding your bird feeders. If you have cats that live outdoors and you keep a bowl of cat food or a bowl of dog food outside, they'll happily raid that. Raccoons will eat almost anything. They like all of the vegetables we give them here, but we'll also give them bits of meat. They like worms, they like crayfish. They have a really wide and varied diet, and that's why raccoons have been such an amazingly successful species in the wild. You want to be really careful if a raccoon wanders into your yard or wanders into your campsite when you're camping, because raccoons can carry a disease called rabies. That hasn't been a big problem around here, mostly in Montana. Uh, if you're going to get rabies from an animal, it will be from bats or skunks. We haven't had a raccoon test positive in many years here, but in the eastern part of the United States, it's a serious problem with raccoons, and that's why a lot of sanctuaries and a lot of rehabilitation centers won't even take them. Let's take a walk down here and take a look at the largest of the animals that lives in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, one of the most iconic animals in Yellowstone National Park, the bison. We have a bison here named Speedy, and we'll come down the trail right here and see her. Now you might be thinking, biggest animal in Yellowstone National Park? She doesn't look that big. And I admit, I'm a pretty big guy, so maybe standing next to me, she doesn't look quite so huge. But actually, Speedy is a tiny little bison, by comparison to other wild bison. The reason she lives here with us, Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary, is that when she was born, she was so small, her mother wouldn't take care of her. She ended up getting raised as a house pet. Can you guys picture that? Picture this little lady right here in your house as a pet. Well, she used to wander around in their house and lay in their laps and watch TV with them until she got just too big for that to work, and that's when she came here. We did try to let her go back out with her herd, but she wouldn't go. And I can't really blame her. If you get used to uh, hanging out with people and sitting on people's laps, really hard to go back into the wild. She weighs about 750 pounds or so. 
which is not nearly as big as a typical bison girl in the wild who would probably weigh 1200 pounds or so and the boys the bulls they can be up over a ton they can weigh as much as a small car now you can tell that speedy here is a girl by looking at her horns a female bison is called a cow and her horns are shaped like the letter c for cow on a bull those horns would be shaped like the letter L, as in the end of bull, and they would point forward as really dangerous weapons. But she's got these curved sea horns and a really, really long tongue, too. Want to show them how long your tongue is? Hmm? So Speedy is getting to be kind of an old girl. She's lived with us here for almost 19 years now. And you may think, wow, she's a herd animal, and here she is all alone with no other bison at this sanctuary. Well, she already said she didn't want to live with other bison, so we've become her herd. And she hangs out with us, and she's bonded with the people here at the sanctuary. Once we bring an animal in, they come in here to live for life. And she's had a pretty good life, because a wild bison probably wouldn't have lived as long as she has. Now let's walk up and take a look at our next animal. When you think of big animals in the Yellowstone ecosystem, you may think of those big hoofed animals, like the bison or like the moose, but there's another big animal, a big predator, which is right at the top of the food chain, and that's the grizzly bear. We don't have grizzly bears here, the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary, but we have the other kind of bear that lives in this ecosystem, and that's the black bear. Let's go meet some black bears. So why would a black bear be living at the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary instead of living a happy life out in the wild eating berries? Well, all four of our black bears came here when they were little cubs, and they came here because they were taken out of the wild, whether their mother was killed, whether they lost their mother, or whether they were taken. They all found their way in here. None of them can live in the wild because none of them know how to fend for themselves. Our younger bears, like Bo here that's crashed out on his tire swing, They've been here for 10 to 15 years, and they're comfortable, and we're constantly changing up their habitat to keep it not just comfy, but interesting. Giving him the tire swing, ramps, different things to climb on, like that structure back behind him, keeps him content. Now, if we look back over here behind me, this is one of our older bears. This is Winnie. She knows that when it comes to feeding time, that little area that she's laying in is where she crosses through to the place where she gets her food. So she'll often just lay there thinking, as long as I'm here, they can't bring in the food without me. You can see a pile of just the kinds of things she's eating right now after having woken from her winter nap. The male bears around here get up earlier than the females. Bo that you were just looking at may have been sleeping on that tire right now, but he's been up and around for a few weeks. Winnie, she just got up, and she's still kind of tired and kind of lazy, and we're trying to fill her up with good, nutritious stuff. Grizzly bears eat a whole lot of meat in addition to all of the other stuff they eat. Black bears, much more fruit. That's why the big pile there of the oranges and the apples and the vegetables like corn we also give them a special bear kibble that has nutrients that they need that they're not getting out of a wild diet. Your typical black bear is a lot smaller than a grizzly. Usually two, 300 pounds is a pretty typical black bear. This big fella right here, who also just woke up, his name is Buster. Uh, we haven't weighed him since he woke up, but when he went down for his sleep, he weighed 509 pounds, which is a lot more grizzly bear size than it is black bear size. So all three of these bears that you've just seen, plus the one that's down over the hill in her den right now, 
I said they're black bears and they're black. Are all black bears black? Well, no, actually they're not. Black bears can be a whole bunch of different colors. They can be blonde, so light that they're almost white, and we call those spirit bears. They can have black fur like this, dark brown fur, and some even a reddish fur, uh, like people with red hair. We call them cinnamon bears. A lot of the bears that live in the Rocky Mountains have a white patch on their chest. Buster's a little too busy eating to show his white patch right now, but he has one. And if you're going to look for a spirit bear, those white bears, you're going to find those more up in Washington State in that part of the country. Okay. If you're ever looking for a really smart bird, look no further than ravens and their cousins, the crows. We think parrots, parrots are so amazingly smart because they can learn to talk. Ravens can also learn to talk. Ravens have a huge variety of sounds that they can make anyway, and they can learn to imitate other animals, other birds, and even people. Our crow has learned to speak just a little bit, but only in Spanish. These are Bart and Lisa, two of our ravens. Bart and Lisa are both here because they can't fly. They can hop really well, and they can, each of them has one fairly good wing and one very bad wing, and that can keep them going enough to be able to hop from branch to branch. They make some, their sounds vary. They can make some very deep sounds a clicking sound like that, but they don't do that caw, caw, that you hear a crow doing. You can tell them also from a crow because they're so much bigger. These guys like to cache their food. So when we feed them, or when they find food in the wild, if there's more food than they can eat right now, they'll take the extra food and hide it somewhere and come back and get it later, like a squirrel hiding acorns. But these guys can remember the hiding places of up to 50 different pieces of food that they've cached or hidden in, in different places. We don't want our ravens having babies here at the park, so we make sure that they don't have anything to build a nest with. If they don't have a nest, they don't lay eggs. They built a nest anyway. We were trying to figure out how on earth they did that. Remember I mentioned ravens are really smart birds? Turns out, wild ravens were flying over, and our ravens would dig up some of their cached food and trade it to the wild ravens for something to build a nest with. So these guys actually developed a system of barter and trade. They figured out a way to buy things to build their nests with when we didn't give them things to build nests with. You wanted to get in on it too, didn't you, Edgar? Edgar, our other raven, actually can fly pretty well. He's just lived in captivity for so long that even now that his wings have healed up pretty well, he wouldn't be able to fend for himself. If we let him loose, he would just come right back to be with us. We prefer animals to live in the wild. That's where they belong. But if they can't live in the wild because they're injured, like poor Bart and Lisa here, because they're habituated, which means they have become dependent on people for their food, like Edgar here, then we have a home to offer them. We have a place for them to live. One of the biggest birds in this ecosystem is the sandhill crane. They're amazing animals. We have two of them here. Niles and Big Bird, yes, Niles Crane. Sandhill Cranes are migratory, which means they live here in the summertime, and then in the winter, when it gets too cold in Montana, they'll migrate, they'll fly away to someplace else to stay warm. In their case, Mexico tends to be a favored spot. They'll often fly in huge flocks. They'll meet somewhere in Utah, and thousands or tens of thousands of them will all fly down together. Sandhill cranes are 
wading birds, as you can see here. They like to have some wet, marshy areas to walk through. Niles and Big Bird both came here with serious injuries. Neither one of them can fly properly, and one of them had a neck injury on top of that. They are the loudest birds that we have around here. When they get to squawking, you can hear them from two miles away. They're really amazing creatures. Thank you all for joining us for this walkthrough at the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary. My name is Gary Robson, and I'm going to leave you with a few thoughts from our resident wolves. Let me translate that for you. They're saying thank you to the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary, to KOA Care Camps for making this all possible, and to Susan Davidson, the owner of the local KOA and the president of the Sanctuary Board. My name is Gary Robson. I'm the executive director of the Yellowstone Wildlife Sanctuary and the host of the podcast, Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. I hope you'll subscribe to our channel and that you'll visit our website at yellowstonewildlifesanctuary.org. Thank you.